might need money. Yeah, <laughs> maybe a little bit more, um, you know, just point us out or something if you have a question. Um, but it makes it easy for the introduction. So I'm Mike Guffrey, I'm the SVP of Business Development at Sweet Hop. We are a uh, sweet marketplace, but not a broker. We're not similar to other secondary sites where our inventory comes from partnerships with teams, companies that are looking to resell. And then if we do deal with brokers, they have to be sanctioned by the team. They have to have contractually obligated suites. You know, if you call us and say, hey, the team gave me the suite, I'd like to flip it. Nah, you know, we, we're, we're working on a really more of an Expedia type model is what we're looking for. So um, the way we're setting up today, a little bit of a panel. Uh, originally, Troy, I mean, we were going to give a presentation, but we decided that uh, we don't want a commercial for anyone since I'm not really with a team. We'd rather have some team and, and get a good discussion here. So with that being said, Mike. <laughs> Remember Mike wants to introduce himself <laughs> first. I invited you. So my name is Michael Salik. I'm on the premium team with the Seattle Sounders. Born and raised about 30 minutes south in Piala. And so spent my career initially with the Seahawks, then went down to Miami, spent two years with the Miami Dolphins. I uh, was part of their renovated stadium, about a $500 million renovation. And it was there able to sell suites for soccer, concerts, also the Dolphins itself. And I mean, now they're even having the Miami Open in tennis. Uh, so my two years there really opened my eyes to just all the unique ways teams can generate revenue, and especially when it comes to renovated stadium. It's, too difficult to make that money back on just 10 home games for football. So what are, how are other events, how are other creative ways that you can drive revenue? And so uh, opportunity came back for me to move back home. Uh, I had just some stuff personally with family that I wanted to get closer to. And I've been here about a year and a half now. And this guy actually called when he was at the Manors when I was a kid, called him and just asked him, hey, how do I work in sports? And he was the one I answered and gave me advice. And uh, we've been connected ever since then. So. Uh, my name is Mike Mandolia. Um, I'm on the premium team with the Mariners, so I have a little bit more of a unique career track. Um, graduated there, grew up in Pennsylvania, um, went to school on Southwestern PA, and then started with the Mariners in 2012. Uh, I was in our first ever inside sales class that we had, uh, so it's a relatively new shift in, in our office. Uh, joined the group sales team in 2013, joined the CTC ticket team in 2014, um, and then realized we wanted to get closer to family life. I just from Pittsburgh. We now have a three-year-old, so at the time we were getting ready to have our first kid. Realized we have a little bit of uh, trouble with that being 2,500 miles away. So we went and I joined the group team with the Pirates. Uh, spent two years there, and then realized, man, we really like Seattle a lot better. And so we came back. So when the premium job opened up, I uh, had the opportunity to come back and rejoin the team. So now I've been here a little over a year, starting September of last year. So um, yeah, a little bit more unique, but. Uh, Northwest is great. It's way better than Pittsburgh, so, <laughs> so not I'm around. from Pittsburgh, no, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. I'll hold it against you. Right. <laughs> um, great. So, as you see, Troy put together a, a panel. We're trying to get just some varying thoughts. Uh, I work on a, obviously, on a platform side, and we have a couple different teams here and, and different levels of expertise. So, thought it would be good just to dive right in and handle this as a typical panel. Um, I'll throw out some questions, uh, give my thoughts on it, and then allow these guys to, to come in and argue their, their point of view or, or agree, hopefully agree most of the time, we'll see. Um, but really the focus is for this, you know, the questions and where we want to get to is that lease, um, leases are going away at least at the level they used to be. You're not getting 10, 20 year leases anymore, even five unless you're in a perfect situation, and then we'll dive into some other you know, modern ways to move premium seats. So first question, and I'll let these guys you know, take it, is the lease dead? Um, and if so, what really has changed and made it dead in the past five or 10 years? Or is it a, it's not me, it's you um, mentality, but actually it's us. Um, have we done a bad job as an industry of selling leases and creating products and marketing, so a lot there, but if, Mike, you wanna go for it? <laughs> Whoever Mike wants to take it. So so what I found, so from a premium standpoint, like our primary job is to engage with businesses, and you know, if I were to sell them something that wouldn't be the standard way a business would use us, my boss is saying you're calling the wrong people, right? So it's usually a tight level of value there. Um, for me, what I found, though, is it all comes down to usage, and it's extremely difficult to quantify um, 
tickets as an investment for a business. You're essentially going in their office, meeting with them 30, 45 minutes, and telling them, hey, based on that meeting, I know now enough about you to sell you potentially six figures worth of seats. You know, and as an owner of a company, I'm like, yeah, screw this kid, right? Like, you don't know enough yet. So for me, it's, it's breaking it down with usage. How can they use their tickets? If they've never been to a Sounders game before, or if they're not even a Sounders fan, I can't expect their clients to know it, right? And so for us, if a lease makes sense, it's great, but we more approach it as long-term value. I'd rather start off small with a company and grow them into something bigger to prove the concept first. When I was in Miami, it was all like annuals, 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 annuals. And we found a lot of people bought an annual suite, then how can they justify it? How can they actually use it? And then the drop that they're after. So it goes back and forth, but it all relates down to usage. Does everybody know what a sweet lease is, by the way? So a sweet lease is essentially a package of suites, right? So like for us, a sweet lease, we have a 10 game plan, and we have a 20 game plan. So a mini, a quarter, a half season. So it's basically season tickets, but sweets. Um, and so to answer your question, I mean, is a sweet lease dead? I mean, no. I, I guess I would say it depends on if there's no value in what you're offering a sweet lease, then yes, I would say it's dead. But if you can provide value to your customers or your prospective uh, clients, then no, it's not. So um, Safeco, back when it first opened, the team was winning hundreds of games a year, drawing 3.5 million fans. The whole suite level was sold out. You couldn't get a single suite. You had full season suites, and everything was locked into suite leases. Um, obviously, things have changed. Financial crisis, all that stuff. Team performance, obviously, has changed quite a bit since then as well. Um, and so we found a niche in terms of now everybody likes options, right? Everybody loves flexibility. So our leases now, for the mini plan in the quarter, you pick your own game. So in our 81 home games that we have, you know, we dynamically price them, right? So. A midweek afternoon in August against the Yankees next year is going to be in our highest demand category, as opposed to April 14th or 15th, Monday or Tuesday against the Indians, is not going to be quite as popular. It's Cleveland, which they're they're good, but it's also April. It's Seattle. It's going to be cold. The weather's not going to be as nice. So you're going to see a range of single game suites from you know 4,500 bucks to two grand, right? Uh, so with our sweet leases, all of the games are treated the same. So you could pick all seven of the midweek day games and really maximize that value. Uh, we don't limit you to the categories, right? You're not, no games are blacked out, all of those kinds of things. So we provide the value to people in going to a lease by letting you pick your own games on the smaller plans. Uh, we also throw in season tickets. So if you do 10 suites, there are two full season seats or four half season seats plus some catering credit. So for 30 grand, it's not just 10 suites, it's 10 suites and season tickets, and you also have this catering credit. So rather than spending 4,500 bucks on a couple of games, you're spending closer to 2,000 for, for games. Obviously, it's the usage bit, right? And if somebody only needs four or five and you sell them 10, they're not coming back, right? So it's finding ways to add value. Uh, we went to last year with our half season suites now can brand their suite. Uh, typically, that's been something that's been reserved strictly for full season. You have your suite for the entire game. You walk in, and it's the Safeco suite, and it's branded Safeco all over the place. Uh, we've added, I think, nine half-season suites between last year and then some for next year already because of the branding aspects. So it allows us to pull from a marketing budget, from a sales budget, and we can get some money from other places that you couldn't get because you have uh, because you have logos and stuff like that all over the place, right? So. Uh, the lease can be dead if there's no value, but if you can create value for your customers, then no, I think there's still a place for them. But I think that's more of a modern touch with having the flexibility and adding those extra incentives in parts of uh, the stadium that you have empty seats, then why not throw in those season tickets if they're not going to be sold anyway? Provide more value to somebody who wants seats by giving them extra things. Yeah, no, it's interesting. I think what we're seeing from a marketplace side is that some venues try to add value. Um, some are status quo, and then we actually have some that you know, just push them or incentivize them in their contracts to resell. And I'm not going to throw anyone under the bus, but there's very large venues that part of their contracts, you sign a five-year lease, you are allowed to resell, go nuts, go crazy. And so some of these venues sell, and it goes back to the value of 
well, do we want upfront money for all these leases or do we want to try to sell them game by game? It's very hard to justify some of these expenses, especially in arenas where you know these big markets can be 200, 300 events a year, even if a company could use those. I mean, they'd have to pay someone a full-time job to try to fill those suites and do the catering invoices. So there is a little bit of a mix going on. Value, some places look at resale, um, and it all is to try to keep the lease or at least, maybe lease is a bad term, but more of a bulk purchase. So instead of individual games, we find people that are buying one, two, or even this season, so. Um, so moving on to something we had, we had talked about a little bit before. Um, <clears throat> a stat I pulled for this is, I think it's from the Harvard Business Journal. 72% of business decision makers still rate their relationships with sales reps as the key to renewing a deal. And as we shift online, um, there'll be a question later that kind of comes back that relates to that. So businesses, even though they're buying online, when it comes to B2B purchasing, they're still looking at some sort of relationship. So my question to these guys, since they're more in the weeds on the team side is, a lot of teams have gone to full menu sales. We see sales academies, and then they jump up into inside sales, then they jump up into senior inside sales. We have 100 levels, and we're all over the board. Um, has that affected premium seating? Because the data from Harvard says, despite all this uh, online stuff, which is still very important for premium seating, at the end of the day to renew, they still need a relationship somewhere. So have you seen full menu become a problem, or how have your organizations fought that? So it's funny, so essentially it's, you, there's this true directory, right? And how many of you just by your hands are, like, are trying to work in sports? Or, okay. So you start usually you're calling if Mike buys a single game ticket to a Sounders game, right? You're getting called the next day. So you came out to that game, tell me about your experience. It's very transactional. As you make those calls and you get better at that, then you start growing your groups or doing the more B2B. Uh, and so like for me, I found that initially when I reach out to businesses, they just want to get straight to it. They're business owners, they're smart, they get why you're calling. The fact that I'm calling them already says they're not interested. Otherwise they would have already called me, right? So I pitch an appointment within like a minute when I call them, right? I give some justifiable reason as to why I was calling them. But once I get that meeting, it's all about how can I help you? And to go back earlier, hey, you're just this young rep, tell me all of what I should know about my business, here's why you should use the Sounders. I try to know as much about their industry as I can. And so for me, I only focus on a few at a time as I'm reaching out to them so I can best understand how to help their industry as a whole and position myself as, hey, I'm an expert in your industry and leveraging Sounders assets, right? So getting back to usage, I want the rep, I want the business owner I'm working with to view me as like, oh, a game sold out, like you need tickets, Mike bought the Sounder to hook you up. Like, he's my boy, right? And I'll use that like on my point, it's like, you, you don't brag about your insurance guy, you don't brag about your doctor, right? But you will brag about me because when we're sold out and you need tickets, like I can come through for you. And what it really comes down to is making them look good. Traditionally, I'm working with somebody that's focused on bringing in new business for their company. So that's like a vice president of business development, right? They're tasked with bringing in new business. So if I make them look good and I, they're getting high fives from their owner, that's all the better for me. And so to go back to usage and what you talked about, like it's a full-time job just to manage tickets. One thing that we've done and built out is helping our clients actually invite their clients. And so for me, it came full circle where on a game day, I could walk into a suite and I don't know who any of my clients are. Like, who, who are they inviting? I don't, I don't know. Like, anyone can say, hey, we work with XYZ company and help them invite their clients out to a game. That doesn't help them. How can we be more specific? So before anyone that works with me, before they buy anything, I know who they're inviting and I'm helping them invite. I'm sending invitations on behalf of them, inviting them out to the game. And so this way I know when I can walk in the suite, I can work the room and I can best help my client they to, uh, pretty much just get in those relationships with their clients. And so to just have access to our brand, whether it's for one game or a season, how can they best use our brand? And so from there, I've seen a huge spike in referrals and a huge spike in just renewals of my clients because they know that I'm looking out for them and I'm making them look good um, and they're getting high fives from their boss. So if I can interrupt then, yeah. so then you would probably say, based on you're talking a lot about referrals, and that's all relationship building. So full menu sales, meaning everybody from inside, the sales academy to inside, to you know, whatever teams have them all over the place, you would probably disagree that you want 
everybody in the organization yeah. being able to sell everything. Yeah. It's a more focused relationship sale. You want dedicated folks. Yeah. I would, so I want them to feel empowered that they can sell it. Like if a rep would come to me and say, hey, can you train me on what you're selling? Like I'm going to help them. I want to grow their career. But I want to ask why. Like if, it's, if you're a younger rep, you want to ask, hey, why do you want to sell premium? Is it because you think you're going to get promoted? If you sell a suite that looks good to the company, like, and that's going to help you, like ultimately, why do you want to work in premium? And what I found to be a key factor is an actual desire to learn an industry and not just sell to it. Just because I sell Joe Schmo's accounting firm doesn't mean I have the right to call every other accounting firm. Right? How, does, how do they use this? How do their clients use this? And so just overall, I feel that teams can be full menu, but you want them meeting with businesses and having an expert knowledge of, of what they're talking about. And so I think best practice is to have a few select reps to go after premium businesses. That's just the way I do. We have a completely different philosophy. So, uh, <laughs> he's, he's the mayor. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the, the thing is, though, too, with us, of us being the mayor, is we do things that are very unique in the way that we run our sales. I mean, we're pretty small to begin with, relative to a lot of teams. Uh, but we all sell and service. So we don't have a specific service department, or we don't have me on the premium team. I sell something, and then that something goes on to whoever else that will service that, and I'm essentially done with them. Um, and so why I think that helps more, right? So relationship building is the biggest thing that you'll hear most people in sports talk about. It's you want to build a relationship. You want to you want to almost be at the point where you're friends with the person that you're selling to, right? And so a lot of times when I have a meeting, it, typically I'll say, hey, let's get together 20 or 30 minutes. The 20 or 30 minutes turns into 45. One, because I talk a lot. Two, because the first 25 minutes, half an hour, is all about nothing regarding baseball, right? It's about, unless they tell me they're a baseball fan, it is more small talk, that then we get to the point of, okay, here, now let's talk. Let's talk a little bit of business, and I've had success with that, and being able to tell them that, hey, Michael, if you, you know, based on what you told me, this makes the most sense, I'll be your guy at the team now and going forward, right? So it's not, I'll be your guy, and then six months later, you're off to somebody else who then is going to take care of you. Uh, so with what we do, it is more of, you sell something and then you keep it, right? So the benefit for me is that I can take somebody who did, so we do a sweet promo, right? So you pay in full for two sweets at March, get 10% off, get a free sweet to use in April, on there, right? So again, value, right? With us, that's our big thing. So I had somebody who did that last year, they referred a colleague who did the same thing, six sweets total, next year they're doing 40, right? So they're, they upgraded into a half season, in part because I sold them those two, had more conversations with them, talked all through the summer, hosted them at a game in May, hosted another set of people at games in July and August, and then again in September, and it upgraded them, moved them up the ladder from Sweet Promo into a Sweet Package, right? Now going from six to 40 doesn't happen very often. It was more of a unique situation, a bigger company. Usually they'll see that Sweet Promo into a mini plan, right? They do the mini plan for a year or two, then they go to a quarter season. They do the quarter season for a year or two, now they're going to the half. And the reason why we have a lot of success with moving them up the ladder is because me as a rep, I don't have to look at this again and say, oh shit, they're going over five games. As soon as they go over that five game mark or whatever that threshold is that they're going on to the service department, I no longer work with them. So I'm not necessarily incentivized to get them into that middle ground. I'm incentivized to take them from nothing to as high as I can get them because then they're gone, right? And so that's when you start to see more of the Somebody got pushed into something at the end of the year, they're talking to the service company, yeah, you know what, it's a little bit too much for us, we don't want to do it again. And they never come back because the rep pushed them somewhere where they shouldn't have gone because you're not servicing, right? So for us, all of our reps sell and service, all of our reps B2B appointments, whether you're in client sales, which is our inside sales program, or you're on the premium team, we all can call whoever we want, get to whoever you want, sell whatever product you want. At the end of the day, it makes us all more well-rounded, so you can have an inside sales rep go to the group team, and then go to the season ticket team, and then go to the premium team, more of the traditional route. But we'll have some of our inside sales reps that will skip groups and go right to season tickets because they had more success and they like season tickets more, versus we'll have those that will follow because they like groups more, they like that sales process better. And by allowing them to sell everything, we allow them to really find a niche at the beginning on what they like. They can focus on that, they can become an expert in that particular product while still having the background to sell everything but nothing to me as a rep or if I was a manager would sound worse than one of my reps coming to me and say well I could have sold them a sweet package but 
I'm not allowed to do that, so I sold them season tickets instead. Sounds kind of silly, right? So we're awful menu, we sell in servers, which the vast majority of teams do not. You're a sales rep, sell, and then you have a service department. So we're a little bit more unique. That's ours. So, I hate that. I would never be able to do that. That's not why. <laughs> it does vary a little bit. I've worked in both, so. Um, so I'm, I'm going to skip ahead because this next question. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Um, would it be uh, difficult to tell that person who said I could sell a suite? Would they send them to the other person, or do they then lose the sale and like commission? And, like, does that play in? So it does, right? Because then at that point, if you're so if you're selling something and then getting rid of it the next year, right? If if you get rid of it and then they upgrade with whoever the other person is, whoever the other person is that technically closes the upgrade gets the commission in most cases. And so you're incentivized to sell them the highest price thing because then you're getting the maximum commission. If they don't renew, it's not your problem. So you don't care, right? So you start to get into the world of so-and-so is saying this and this just to close the deal, and then the person who is servicing them has issues with bringing it back because so-and-so told them something wrong or gave them a free suite or gave them a jersey or gave them whatever it is that they had to do to close the deal, understanding that oh, I don't have to worry about renewing them so I can tell them whatever. So you start to get into that world of, I undersold them, uh, and then it could have told you that this is exactly what they're going to do next year, and the service rep gets all the credit for that, so the service rep gets it, or it's the opposite, where the sales rep oversells them. And then to Michael's point earlier, they don't come back, right, because they were oversold. And it's really hard to get back to the point where we're saying, hey, I'm your guy, right? You should trust me. It's really hard to get them back into that. We're going to trust somebody from the Mariners because that first person screwed us over. Usually it's... I'm never working with them again because I had a bad experience with my first sales rep, right? Does that answer your question? So just for you guys, I'm skipping three because four, I see it <laughs> blends in a little bit better. So we're talking about full menu um, and, and sales, and then uh, I think the statistics, 72% view the relationship, which is interesting because there's other statistics that seem to kind of go completely against that. And I think in premium, we're unique where we have a mix, people just don't realize it. So while at the same time, three-fourths of all your clients are, they want the relationship, um, it says 52% of B2B purchases will be made online um, in, in 2018. Now that doesn't mean sweet tickets, that's any B2B purchase. So it can be skewed with office supplies or, or something like that. But um, it also follows up with 49% of B2B e-commerce buyers end up buying B2C because the platforms for B2B are so bad that they go and they, they end up just buying B2C because B2B e-commerce is built out poorly. And so one of the things at SweetHop that we're trying to do is create a platform that has all information that's very user-friendly, that also includes all of the information you need. And I know teams have varying different philosophies on this. So some teams do provide information, um, and then they, they after the information you still can't buy, but you can call in, you have the information, think like cars.com. Most people go to cars.com to find out as much information as they can about what they want, and then they'll reach out to a dealership, unless it's a unique situation where they've already driven the car a hundred times and love it or whatever. So for suites, what we look at is, what is right, what is wrong, where are we in the middle um, as an industry, because we're all over the board. We have some websites that literally say, we have suites, call us, and that's it. We have some websites that say, here's the pricing, but it doesn't give the games or availability, which exact suite, fill out this form or call us. And then we have some that have all the availability, at least up to date. And then us at SweetHop, we have everything is you can buy online or call, you know, et cetera. So the question for the, the team, the teams is, you know, where are you at with that? Where would you like to be? And where do you see the industry going in that front? I know that was where you have a bit confused anyone, but I understand. So like right now for us, if you're on the sound of the website, and you can see what all of our assets are, uh, whether they're suites, they're field seats, you can get a high level description of what everything comes with and what's included, but there's no pricing. Um, part of that is maybe not to scare people away, uh, because a lot of people could have a totally disconnect with how much a suite costs, and that goes either way, whether they think it's extremely on the higher end or on the more affordable end, right? It's, it's all based on what what they've experienced in the past. But to give you an idea, when we get someone that requests information over about a suite, you know, it goes into my manager's email, he sends it to me or my coworker, and it's a breakdown of here's what I'm looking for. 
90% of the time, believe it or not, they don't even ever respond when we reach out. I'll call them, send emails, they don't even send us, right? It's or it's, hey, I wanna, I wanna get a suite for my kid's birthday party. Wow, it's $4,000 for one suite, you got no thanks, like my kid's not, you know, needing that for a birthday, right? So, often, if it is a B2B, I still never even wanna talk pricing when they're reaching out. I want to book an appointment. I wanna still justify how they can use it, because when it comes to them reaching out to us, like, while well, that's great, they might have experienced that in another team, this could just be an entirely new, different way for them to go after your business. I want to understand what are they currently doing right now, right, and how to justify it. Like, so as an example of this, worked with the company this year, for him, he just wanted a big time experience for his clients, no offense to him, but they've always done the Mariners, they've always done the Huskies. You can't get a Seahawks suite unless you want to spend 40 grand for one. Um, and so for him, he just wanted something different. It was soccer, he wasn't sure how it would work. So rather than selling the suite, I sold him our final 20 experience, which is essentially the entire group could be escorted on the field for the last 20 minutes of the game. Right, like that's what I sold, it comes with a suite. Right, and so it depends on how you want to position it. So I just say for me, it's, if you go too much information out there, you get rid of all your pricing, you lose your leverage. And then it just becomes a pricing discussion. Oh, I, I only want to spend three grand, not four grand. I want, to get, I want to keep their curiosity, get them to call, but ultimately schedule a meeting. Out of curiosity, how many people are you look, you're looking for someone to go to dinner or whatever, you look at a menu online, you don't see pricing, and you immediately decide not to go there. Right? I do that. Right? So I think about in my, what would, in what information would I want before I go and buy something, right? And if you're buying a suite, general expectation is you're going to spend a decent amount of money. There are some people that are like, oh, I thought it was, no, a thousand bucks total, right? It's just you're not even close to the realm of where what what makes sense, right? Maybe because I've been around baseball figures for six years. And, um, but so for us, if you go to Marys.com, you see all the pricing, you see what games are in what category, you can find all the information that you want, whether it's the Diamond Club, the first saver is behind home plate, also clubs in an all-inclusive space that we have on the suite level, um, or the suites, right? You can find all of the pricing and games and the plans and all of that stuff online and for me I would rather have somebody be able to go and look at the pricing but then to buy you have to call us right because Diamond Club sold out also Club sold out last year this game versus that game right there are all these other things that you have to finalize whether it's a suite or a premium season ticket package um, and so yeah I mean for me I like having the information up there because if I'm going to spend a decent amount of money I want to know what the price is before I go into the phone call because being a sales rep, right, you go and buy a car and they're, they're talking all these, they're, you're getting all of these different numbers and all these different things and after a while it gets confusing and you start to forget, this is what I really came for and now I'm talking about that, right? And so by having all the pricing out there, people have a realistic expectation of what they're going to spend based off of the experience that they want. Uh, so it limits maybe, and we still get, the, the most annoying thing in the world as a rep is you get an online lead, someone's like, I want information and they never buy you back. Uh, or they never answer, they never do anything at all. Um, but at least when we get our leads, our information, by a general rule of thumb, people know what to expect. Sometimes, so our suites, when we put out the pricing, it's per ticket, because you don't necessarily have to buy 20, you can buy 14, you can buy 26, there's a, there's a range in terms of number of people. So we'll get some people like, oh, I thought it was 200 bucks total, right? And not 200 bucks per person, so we certainly get some of that. Um, but we get more of a qualified lead because people know what to expect. And to Michael's point, if it's a company, I'll research the company if it's a pretty big one instead of, you know, maybe I close them on that one suite, but then when they're in the ballpark, it's, hey, you know, thanks for coming out. And I saw you guys have 400 employees. Do you do anything else? Let's get together. And I don't want to take up your time now. You're here to enjoy the game. You're not here to talk to me, but let's get together in a couple weeks or whatever the case may be and talk about more high-level type things. So it's... Um, you can still upsell them, right? You need someone to come in and say, we want to spend four grand. You realize you have this really great experience that you can go out on the field and they're willing to spend 10, right? So you can still do some of that stuff, but I prefer to have the information out there because hiding the information to me personally says, oh, this is going to be really expensive. I'm going to go find something else I can find for So I lean, again, opposite of it, more towards having information out there. Because the internet's a thing, right? You can look at it, you can, look, you can find anything on on your finger, just find information, right? So I don't have any information out there. Yeah, it's interesting for us because we're pulling a lot more traffic since we sell for pretty much every venue in the country. 
Um, we can't really bid on Google terms, and I don't know how familiar everyone is with pay-per-click, but you know, when you're searching for a product and that ad comes up, they're paying to put that ad on there. In suites, everybody who's looking for a suite ticket puts on that ad, and so that doesn't mean they're qualified to be a, a suite holder. And so my feeling is the more information, the better. We qualify a very low percentage because a lot of our leads come in because sitting in a suite would be awesome with your friends for Taylor Swift until you find out that's a $15,000 suite. Um, and you get a lot of those in there. So we try to put as much out there as possible. And in fairness, though, we're in a different world than the teams. I mean, teams are at least somewhat structured. Our prices are all over the board just because we sell baseball, football, concerts, you know, different venues. So, um, well, we got about 20 minutes. Oh, sorry. How often do you actually close when you don't have the prices up? Like when people call you and inquire, like how common is it for people to say, okay, like, Less than, less than 10%. It's, it's very rare. Um, well, I hold them on a suite. For me, it's I might move them into group tickets if I find out that makes the most sense for them. I just feel a lot of people, they have this unrealistic, unrealistic idea of how much it's going to cost. So while and that's my thought with pricing, if they see it, they're like, oh, it scares them away. They don't know necessarily all the other options that they can utilize to do a game. Okay, well, maybe 20 group tickets instead of a 20 person suite makes more sense for you. Right, it's just, for us, it's just a matter of having that conversation first. And then going with, hey, I'm a consultant, I'm your friend down here at the stadium, let's work, you know, let's go so you can come out to the stadium and we'll walk you through some of your options. Do other teams really use the same? Yeah, I mean, that's what, that's what I was used to in Miami, so maybe that's my approach. It, oh, it's, another point to really illustrate too is it depends on the league. I mean, you're, you're in baseball, you get 81 home games, right? In soccer, like I tell the companies this all the time, I play a fourth the amount of home games that the Marys do, but we actually have a longer season than they do. Right? This year, it was March 1st to October 28th, so there's no natural demand to it. We play once a month, maybe twice a month. When I was in football, it's like, look, if you miss week one, all of a sudden it's week two and there's a bye, right? There's only eight actual games, so it naturally drives people to that. And so, and the other thing is, for a soccer team, we play in a football venue that has way more suites than what most soccer teams venues have, too. Um, so there's a lot of other things that go into it. Even us, like we're tenants of our stadium. So we, we pay rent every time we have a host a game there. So there are some little things that we can't do. We're like we can't bring our suites. They're branded with the Seahawks, right? So there's a lot of certain challenges within that um, that kind of dictate what you can and can't do. Uh, our VP of strategy came from baseball. Um, so we're more used to that, but that's just what our approach is now. There's no perfect. Yeah. There's no perfect. yeah. It's, yeah. Like the Pirates, so when I was with Pirates, they showed no information on it, so it was the same style. You could see the general nuts and bolts, but you can actually see the prices. You had to call and talk to somebody. That goes back to earlier. If you can sell full menu, if someone calls in and they want to do a suite for 100 people, and a suite for 100 people doesn't make sense, but now I can ship them into a hospitality space, right? Or I can ship them into group tickets and gift cards by being empowered to sell whatever product that we have to sell. I can shift somebody up and down the ladder on one phone call to maximize. If someone says they have to spend six grand on 100 people, I'm not going to pitch them private suites because they're going to spend 100, right? It, just, it makes no sense. So it allows me to customize what they want. Is food and beverage important? Okay, here's why. If food and beverage is really important, you want a private space, the best I can do, it's, it's 7,500 bucks. Now you said six grand was your, was your max, but here's why you should spend an extra 1,500, right? Because you want a private space, you want it for the whole game, you want food and beverage included. This is how we can get you there. Doing seats are great, right? But I'll tell people all the time, doing seats are great, but you'll get to know the four people that are sitting around you really well in your pod, but someone who's sitting on the other end of the row, get a telescope and a megaphone, right? You might be able to have a conversation with them. And so that you can still get people up the ladder and down the ladder, but that's why I think it's important to empower people to sell full menu, because then you can find the right fit for them to then allow them, as opposed to being a $10,000 hit in year one, and nothing, it's a 10,000 hit in year one, a 10,000 hit in year two, maybe they go up or down in three or four, right? So now you're keeping them coming back because you took the time to find the right product. And now they like you, right? So people buy from people that they like, right? And so it goes back to the relationship. Right, exactly. So that's the biggest piece with all of that is that it comes back to being personable and being able to make a recommendation based on what he told me, here is why this makes sense, not just, this makes the most sense because it costs the most money, right? So. Anything else? Yeah. This might be for both of you. 
but in relationships that you're building with these businesses that are renewing the leases for the suites um, year after year, have you seen um, when those sales reps leave the company, how is that relationship affected after they leave and what kind of reactions are there with the business? Yeah, <laughs> uh, depends on who they work with, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, well, I, I'll never talk bad about a current colleague or a former colleague, right? Um, but for me, I'll, I'll go in there if I am rewarded with an account that I inherit from someone else. It's the you know, best thing you haven't heard of yet, right? Kind of thing. Like, I'm going to serve you way better than they did, right? So just take that pressure off them because oftentimes, so if you think like, who's buying the suites? Very rarely do I call in a CEO. CEO doesn't buy a suite. He signs off on it because his VP has said, hey, I think we should do this to help our business. Okay, great, cool. Right? And similar with like a large group, it's usually someone else in HR. It's an entirely different person. And so it's just a matter of like, once again, who am I helping to get high fives from their boss? I want that CEO to high five the VP, be like, what an awesome suite night that was. And we closed a big sale with that company. Right? I want them to high, high five the HR rep and be like, this is one of the best employee events that we've done. It's way better than the annual summer picnic that we've done. Right, so that's what my approach is. And I even go back to like, look, my mom's a wedding coordinator. That's true, like I've been helping, it's my blood to put on your event, but helping doing this since I was 10 years old. Let, let me help you get a high five from your boss. I love getting accounts that were managed by someone else in part because if you work somewhere, right, you know all of the people that are there or the person that left that you know did they do a good job? Maybe did they not do such a good job, right? Or what's the reason why they left? Do you know, you can guess the level of service that the person got. And so my first thing, especially if it's a high spend product, my first thing is, I wanna meet with you. Let's get together, we we'll just wanna get a little bit of feedback on how everything went last year, learn how you guys are using the product, right? And we talk a little bit about next year, wanna make sure you're doing what makes the most sense for you, right? And so then you go into the meeting and it's, it's basically a new business meeting at that point for me. That's a super warm lead because they're a current client of the team, not necessarily mine, but of the team. And so it does two things. One, it allows you to move them from, so they were working, this is a bad example, they were working with Michael and now they're working with Mike, right? And so now I'm shifting you from person A to person B, but then I'm also giving myself the chance that if person A stole them into something that undersold them or oversold them, I can now make a better recommendation while well, you had this, this, and this problem last year. What do you think about, so an example I had, I had someone who did, we did the buy two get one free, right? And they did like three or four different games throughout the year, and they said they should, we had really trouble filling those suites that many games, I don't think we are gonna do anything again. Uh, but in the meeting, my recommendation to them was we have premium suites, right? So the press box suite, home plate suite, great location behind home plate, include a pre-game guided tour, uh, has additional catering credit. So you're gonna spend about the same, but it's one game and it's a really elevated experience. How do you feel about doing this instead of doing multiple games, right? And so now I save me, I spend a little, a couple thousand dollars less, but in a premium world, a four or five thousand dollar loss really doesn't affect me that much, right? It's like three or four hundredths of a percentage point for me in my overall goal. Um, as opposed to losing a full 15, that's a pretty big deal, right? So I love taking over stuff from other people because it allows me to make sure they're in the right product and I can provide them better taste, but I can provide them better service than anybody else in our team, so. Uh, it ultimately goes back to how that individual left. Okay. It was a bad situation, you just left, but most of the time you're getting a handoff from them. Hey, I was given this, like, we were each on our third team or the second team, right? So you grow your career, you change teams a lot. So in a good situation is, hey, I accepted this other opportunity. I want to introduce you to my call, call you. If you have a good relationship with people, they're gonna appreciate that. I have some that I worked with when I was first here that now I'm back to, because when I came back, LinkedIn, and I said, oh, we want to work with you, and we shifted. So I have a couple accounts back that I worked with when I was here before, just based off of relationships, right? And so it really is the lifeblood of the team. People are going to buy. Again, people are gonna buy from people that they like, and they're gonna keep coming back because they like you. We've had instances where somebody leaves and the person cancels, or we've had instances where somebody gets promoted onto a different team, and you know you have a $800 20 game two seat bleacher account that's with a premium rep because the season ticket holder wants to be with the premium rep, and we're not gonna. It doesn't make sense to make the customer angry by saying you, your rep no longer sees you as important because they have a different job. 
you want to keep, you, the end of the day, you want to keep the customer happy, right? That's the main goal. What do you do when the team sucks? So, as an Let's example, no, 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 no. So, so, as an example, you, um, you know, as you started off this whole session by saying, you know, we used to have full, you know, sold out yes. sweeps. So now you go through the season. You get, you got great. Your service reps are doing wonderful things. You get halfway through the season, your team's out of the playoffs. Okay. Do you guys have something at that point in time where you go into emergency mode, survival mode, even though everything seems wonderful? Because you know at the end of the year, when the season comes, some CEO is going to be looking at this and saying, you know, this was great, we had great service, but you know what, we couldn't even give those tickets away because the team sucked. Do you guys have something like a survival mode that all of a sudden you, you, you go ahead of time thinking, hey, we, we're going to lose five or ten sweets this year. How do we stop that now by throwing in all these extras that you're starting at the season by giving them? Do you have a program that actually starts that when the team starts to do love? You like liquidate them on Sweetheart. For me? You <laughs> liquidate them on Sweetheart. I mean, a lot of it depends on a lot of it depends on when. So if you go into the season knowing the team's not going to be very good, as a rep, it certainly doesn't help anything. It's a lot easier to sell a team that's winning than it is to sell a team that's losing. Even though I don't lead any conversation with, "Hey, we're in first place. You should buy." Like I'm not selling directly, selling wins and losses. While I am indirectly selling wins and losses because somebody wants to come and see the Red Sox. If you're a 110 or 108 win team, a hell of a lot more people are going to be excited to buy your product, right? So sometimes it depends on if it's before the season, you really can combat it with, a lot of times I'll ask somebody, the last Mariners game you went to, what was the score, right? Most of the time you don't remember, but you probably remember who you went with and where you sat and how much beer you drank or what kind of food you ate and garlic fries and all that kind of stuff, right? So it's more of that, where it's, yeah, I know we're not good. My life, I said this all the time, my life is a hell of a lot easier if we make the playoffs. I love it. As a fan, it's great. Everybody wants to be a part of a winning team. As an employee, it's even better, right? Um, in season for us, in our philosophy, we don't do a lot of that stuff because then it undercuts all of the value that you are putting into your product. So if we get eliminated in July, which has certainly happened more times than, than not, um, you know, if I start coming out and saying, well, you can get a suite for a thousand bucks, what's your incentive to buy it early next year? If the team's not going to be good, now you're just incentivizing people to wait until it gets later but, in the year. But not necessarily. I mean, why couldn't you throw an extra 10 tickets and why couldn't you throw a party for something? Like something yeah. extra, because you know that that suite's going to cost you 12x to yeah. try and get that suite back. Sure. So why wouldn't there be lost leaders along the way where you guys are forecasting, you know, we're going to lose five to 10 of these suites this year. What do we do now? to try and stop that, because it's gonna cost us this much to try and replace it. So, I guess my response to that, the benefit of selling businesses is it's, it's almost bulletproof to that team objection, because they're traditionally inviting someone different every single time. So if I, I tell companies this all the time, if I were to call you, you've never been to a Sounders game before, right? And I invite you out to a suite with free food and drinks, you would probably more than likely go. Especially if you're not even a fan, because you don't even know what our record is. To go back to Bart's keynote speak, like our season base has gone down even as we want. We want a championship, right? So for us, it's always maintaining that high ground. And it goes back to the usage and how you justify why they should have used you to begin with. So a real life example is a company I worked with this year. They were having a hard time filling the suite because the date got moved from a weekday to a weekend. No, excuse me, it was vice versa. It was a weekend to a weekday, and it was an eight o'clock start time in Seattle. They're just they were having a hard time filling it. So I said, send me more people that you want to invite. And I personally started calling their clients on behalf of them, because I wanted to make sure that suite got filled. And I was pitching the experience. So I'll do whatever it takes to fill the suite. If it fills the suite, that's what matters. You get people in there. Um, but I'm not going to necessarily give free tickets away just because the team did bad, because that's not ultimately why people buy. They don't, like, I, we tell all the time, like, we don't, we don't sell seats, we sell what they represent. This is moments in time, right? When a guy scores a goal, like this is awesome. Like that was the best goal I've ever seen. So then, what's what's your what's your retention percentage for suites for suites. a year? We renew individual game suites at ninety percent. You're ninety yep. percent. And you guys are so our group suite number last year I think was closer to forty. Um, but then this year we sold the second most suites that we've ever sold in the history of Seattle Field. So a lot of it. Sometimes we'll do flash sales more on like center field bleachers and left field bleachers where for. 
the next 24 hours, you get them for 15 bucks or 10 bucks or things like that. Uh, we've done some stuff with current people who have bought a suite during that current season if we have a ton of availability in September or season ticket holders where we typically, so season ticket holders typically get 15% off on suites, we require them to buy 20 tickets. Uh, where we said, hey, you can get 15% off on this date if you buy 14, which is the bare minimum. If you bought a suite already during the season now, we're, we're presenting you the opportunity to buy another discounted suite at 15% off, but we've never done anything where we would just give something away for free, because then again, you're incentivizing somebody to wait later. So there are a lot of teams like the Pirates would sell a pro-rated season ticket plan in August. So if the team is making a great run, you're gonna get all these people that are gonna boost your numbers for 2018, for example. And as soon as the team takes a tank, they're, they're the first ones off the boat. So we cut out all of our season ticket stuff is cut off second week of May. So in a year like this for us, or we were really hot all the way up through July 1st and went to Colorado and got beat up and then went to the All-Star break and got beat up as soon as we came back. All of those people, we would have sold them into stuff for this year, would be the first ones that are saying we're not coming back because we didn't make playoffs. So we want to, we retain the value or we still want to incentivize people to buy early and not reward people that wait until the last minute or wait to hop on the bandwagon when, it, when the team is looking good because again, they're going to drop first. Yeah, but I don't think you do, I don't think you devalue the product if, if you're throwing in things after the fact. So well, my response to that is what happens when the team's good? Pardon me? You know, my response to that when the team is good. Everybody's happy. Like, hey, you gave me ten tickets before last year. Are you gonna do we that? We had ten tickets year? last year to give you. This year we don't because the team's doing well. Yeah. So I, I just look at it again like a, so baseball, right? The, the great part about baseball is you have a lot of games. The challenge with baseball is you have a lot of games. Right? So if I'm a full season ticket holder and I realize the Mariners in July are giving away tickets to people who are brand new, why am I renewing my full season seats when I can just wait until July? If the team is in it, we'll buy for the second half of the season. If the team's out, we'll buy. Well, again, that's not what I'm saying. You know, I mean, that's changing the wording. All I'm saying is the fact that you're going to have 10% people drop off. You're going to have 60% drop off. Sure. You know. To bring in something, you know, halfway through the season, three quarters way through the season, try and save the, those customers. You think that really discounts your brand to a point that it's going to have a negative effect on you the next year? Well, I think some of the things that I've seen for, and I, I was in premium for quite some time, is that I do agree from the onset that premium doesn't follow the, the ticket sales cycle. Um, the ticket sales cycle says on the on sale millions of tickets are sold and it tapers off throughout the year. Part of that because of games, but part of that because of advertising. The secondary market follows that similar model for concerts and other things. Businesses have the suites for a different reason. If a business is gonna keep using that suite as long as their customers are coming, the, the way I've always pitched it when I was in sales meetings is you're not buying tickets. I don't need your money from the sales department. I need your marketing department. Because if you're coming into this suite as an ROI. You're not coming into this suite as you know, this is fun, we're gonna give it to some employees. You're entertaining. You're going to this game no different than if you're taking a customer to the Capitol Grill um, or whatever is the famous steakhouses around here in Seattle. And so it's a, it's a different sale. I've seen that those trail off not within one year when the team's doing bad, but normally it takes a couple years when their customers don't care, when they're not starting to get value, they go away. So by giving additional value onto a suite, to try to save them at the end of the day, to me that has never really helped because what you need is to keep providing them value, which so, is their ROI. So the reason that I, that I asked that is because before I was in the ticketing industry, I actually ran a suite in Vancouver for the Canucks and the Grizzlies. So I've actually been the person on the other side actually having to justify every single yep. season why we are doing this. Um, to, to, to our CEO. And that's why I ask the questions, because I have been on that other side, and I agree with a lot of the things you say, but again, at the other point in time, I have to go every year to, I had at that point in time, you know, I was in that position, so I don't necessarily sure. agree with you, because I have actually had to justify writing that check, where a lot of people in this industry are never on the other side, and are actually sitting in that seat. And I can tell you, that if when the Grizzlies were doing terrible in Vancouver days and you know couldn't give away the tickets, if there were extra things, you know, I think I could have convinced my CEO, let's go another year. Just my thoughts. Well, sorry. 
Yeah, yeah. earlier to uh, your comment and back to usage, like no one, no one likes an empty suite. A habit of looking around, and going dark, 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 and dark. Mm -hmm. um, do you work with some of your uh, the, maybe less appropriate with all the dynamics and single suite sales? But do you encourage them when they can't use the suite to occasionally look at putting that to a charity or oh, yeah. uh, helping them, helping them say, you know, here's here's something where we can help you get maybe a tax receipt and we'll make sure that there's people in that suite. Yeah, I did that early on, but now it, my approach is I want to know who's attending and I'm gonna help my client help them bite them out to the suite before they even buy it. So this way they're never over committing. I can't tell you how many accounts that I've run into that bought a suite from us a couple of years ago, yeah. right? That didn't renew and it's because we weren't told how to use them. Yeah, okay. and maybe more broadly from maybe not just Mariners and the Sounders, but broader experience across the industry, what other teams are doing? Most, I, I, most I do that. Yeah, and what especially with um, the new tax law. Well, it's it's interesting because the luxury suites were never a great write-off anyway. That's a big misconception. You can never write off the full cost of the luxury suite. It's actually better off on the write-off to give it away to charity. <laughs> you actually get more even before. And now that you can't write it off at all, there is some tax and financial, you know, ability to, to make some money back. But I, I would think that every team has some sort of charity built in. Um, and now there's national organizations that pop up. We were, there's three or four that contact us on a daily basis. It's just difficult. We don't own any inventory. So for us, it's just kind of like a pass through. We can make it aware. But I can't think of one team that doesn't offer that. Or offer the ability to donate. It's like you can't resell it. But you can donate it, right? So mm -hmm. the USO and all the other our community partners that you can donate to. And how how aggressively do some teams look at that? Because I mean, as you know, it's not a good look when you're looking around an arena and I think it ten, ten of the yeah. ten of the so forty suites about, are dark. You're like, oh, that's not okay. a good look for the club, really. Yeah, I'm sorry, I misunderstood. So you're talking like when I know going into a game that we got X amount unsold. Yeah. Okay, I understand. Yeah, for us. Well, go unsold, but also, I mean, it's yeah. rare that somebody um, wouldn't use any part we of don't, So, I mean, we have our own community department within our team that gives back to the community in other ways. Um, granted, I, I get asked a lot, hey, can you donate a suite for this auction? And I'll be more than happy to go to my boss and make an ask. Um, but ultimately, it's, it's not our responsibility or job description to pass out suites for free to auction. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, anyway. <laughs> we'll, we'll cover it off. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so to touch on your point and, and to kind of bring it into the earlier point you guys made, you talked about uh, adding value for your clients. Do you have metrics to that that is the value that is you know besides just getting buses? So we a lot of times too. It depends on what it is that you're buying, right? If you're in a sweet lease. The things that we are able and allowed to do are a lot different than if it's a single game suite on the 4th of July, right? So, um, news visits, and we just rolled out a new, it's an engagement program. So, it's more on the same ticket side, but so we have, as an apartment, we get a list of accounts that seats in this homestand. I have X number of autographed baseballs, X number of plaques that we've had from previous games, X number of things that I could just go and say, hey my god, I'm going to be in the ballpark tonight, so you guys have some tickets, so let's stop down and give you this as an added value, and more as a thank you at that point. Right, but that, uh, that's, So bits and pieces like that, but we don't... So that's transactional, that's right? I mean, that's like, but the, yeah. I guess, metrics of the kind of tangible... Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, so it's it's impossible to this point. Whether you take someone out to a state dinner or to a game, what's the difference, right? right? Ultimately, it comes down, would you rather hit a beer together, high five together, or have an awkward hour long dinner? But for me, I do the most I can to mitigate that by helping my clients invite them out. So like, if you were to work for me and be invited, you're getting an email from me on behalf of my client inviting you out to the game. And then I'm taking care of all the parking, all the tickets. Like for some folks, it's a full-time job managing all the tickets. But then it's by knowing and having communication with all of their clients that they're inviting and engaging with, it allows me to build a relationship with them and then I can find out, I'd ask my client after, so here's why you bought this week, what happened? And I've worked with T-Mobile that sold a $2.5 million deal in the suite during the game. Whether the suite actually moved them over the hump or not, it, it didn't matter. Like they spent five grand and got 2.5 million, right? So it ultimately just comes down to what they what they bought it for and how you can best justify it. Right. But overall, it's pretty difficult to do. Right. Yeah, I mean, I understand that. So yeah. it's like how do you quantify you know, love or whatever. Yeah. 
yeah. but it doesn't hurt. It's yeah. not a bad no, thing. No, right. so I'm just curious if, you know, if there are metrics that you guys use. But I mean, it's you know the value of relationships. It's there, right? right? It's tangible, but uh, you know, people like numbers. <laughs> yeah, it is hard. Because the only way I would know if somebody if that really put us over the top is if they told me. That, right. Mm -hmm. Right. So like. You just yeah. go based off of the experience that I can, or the service that I can provide to elevate their experience the best that it can be. Mm -hmm. and then, if we had a way of doing that, I mean, we would yeah. change well, the yeah. I would, I mean, we would, yeah. So unfortunately, we got through three of the eight questions. Uh, <laughs> but we are out of time. The couple of things that we yeah. wanted to talk about that I think Troy had pushed were opaque distribution, and then my arch nemesis, the, uh, renovation into theater boxes that have all-inclusive, meaning less people coming in, spending less than your expenses or more. So if anybody would like to talk about those, I'll be around probably till four o'clock today before I have to catch a flight. Um, these guys, thank you. Mike and Mike and Mike and Mike. Um, I thought it was really good. Uh, I know it's hard to get up here sometimes and you guys disagree on a couple things or you've known each other for a while, but I thought it was a pretty good discussion. Premium's changing and so, um, I appreciate everybody's questions and, and we'll be around. So thank you for thank you. coming in.